ABC Listen. Podcasts, radio, news, music and more. Tata Pogacar has hit his opposition out of the park and over the fence. That makes it win number six. That was the sound of history being made at the Giro d'Italia this year. He won that Grand Tour by the biggest margin since 1965. It feels as though the record book is Tadej Pogacar's biggest rival right now. And it's about to put him to the test as the Tour de France starts this weekend. The Slovene will seek to become the first man in 26 years to claim the pink and yellow jerseys in the same year. Can anyone stop him? What of the Australians? There's a whole lot to unpack. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily. Catherine Bates is a former Australian road race champion, a Com Games champion. She's an Olympian. She's a co-host of the excellent Wheelhouse podcast. She's going to talk to us about Tadej Pogaccio. Kate, we knew Pogaccio is good, but can you break down why right now he's such a dominant force in cycling? It's a good question because there's a lot of talent out there at the moment, but I think there's something really unique about his attitude and the way he goes into all of the different styles of racing that he does. I mean, physically, he obviously has a lot of talent, but strategically, he's wise well beyond his years. Joao Almeida is caught now. Pogaccia is in a perfect position to try and launch and win this stage. But he also seems to be able to rebound really well uh, from hardship. Like, he's so resilient physically uh, and emotionally, and that's a really rare trait to have in a 25-year-old. While it feels as though he's in a class of his own, he is going to carry the weight of history as he tries to win a Tour de France here. Can you break down for us just how much is at stake? This year he seems like he's unbeatable and he goes into the Tour de France on paper, perhaps with no competition. The metronomic power of Tade Pogaccia continues towards the top of this mountain. But in saying that, he won two versions of it and then he got beaten for two years by Jonas Vingegaard. Jumbo Visma for the second year running, guiding Jonas Vingegaard to the finish line. So I think that he knows his vulnerabilities and also other riders know his vulnerabilities as well. He is dominant going in this year. He's had an incredible season and he's in many ways been unbeatable. And you can't argue that when he's at his best, he's incredibly Difficult to beat. On the left-hand side, Tadej Pogacar going for the line. It's four wins in Volta Catalunya. Tadej Pogacar wins the final stage with a flourishing sprint into Barcelona. But we do have a range of competitors this year that we haven't had in years past. There's probably five or six guys that are knocking on the door. In, in years past, it's been one or two. And I think spread across the different teams, that will add another layer of vulnerability. But they've put so much into Team UAE, which is where Pogacar rides, and down to the fact that even the bikes they ride, they're Colnagos, they've done this incredible amount of research and development on every single inch of the bike. Sometimes they're riding without handlebar tape to save weight in mountains. Like they're really kind of doing all the one percenters. And I think aside from his own personal expectation, there's a very big expectation from the team and the sponsors that they've put the whole team into him uh, and he needs to deliver. But he, he's pretty mature in his approach to handling uh, that pressure and expectation, but it is a lot. Sometimes when an athlete is seen as being clearly above the rest, the industry, the fans, they can get bored. I kind of remember even Roger Federer, you know, the adored Roger Federer being in that space at times during his career. Is there any blowback against the Slovin? Yeah, I got bored when Chris Froome was winning so much, I have to say. Uh, there is certainly an element of when it's playing out and they're winning so much. And we saw a bit of that at the Giro d'Italia that he won. He didn't just win the GC, but he also won six stages. Individual brilliance with exceptional team support. He was the winner of stage two. He's been in the pink jersey ever since. And he keeps on racking up the successes. And there were a lot of fans saying they were switching off the live coverage because they sort of knew what would happen anyway and they would just watch the highlights. So I think in that regard, people are hoping that there is a lot of really hot competition at the Tour de France that does keep it interesting. He is a guy, though, they say, like, he doesn't give away wins. So even if strategically he could, 
He doesn't. He likes to win whenever he can. And I think that there will be an element of, you know, whether people are finding it a little bit boring or not. But also inevitably in this sport, there's there can be so much bad luck and there's so much drama and he's not above that. You know, he went into last year's tour undercooked after breaking his uh, scaffold and the way he rides, he is quite daring. Pogacar pulls the trigger and says farewell to the rest. He's got one to chase. It's Pelizzari who's out in front of him. 48 seconds, 5.3 k's to climb. He's on his own yet again. So it wouldn't surprise me if he had a few scuffles of his own and it didn't go all quite the same as what it did in the Giro where he was so dominant. As you sort of touched on, he might be the favourite, but he's not actually the reigning champ. That's Jonas Vingegaard, who will start after recovering from what was an awful crash. Barry is another one. Another one. And another one. And another one. Oh, 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 and more. Not nice at all. It is a real nasty one. Quinton Hermes in there, but that's I I think that's Vingegaard. The the way the riders are reacting now. We're rocked by this. Look at it from this distance. And that's a concrete gutter, a gully there. Do you think that the Dane can upset Pogaccio and who else do you see as being in the mix? Yeah, I think in week one it'll be the Pogaccio show. So we start with a mountain stage already on day one, um, albeit low mountains, but five KOMs along the way. It wouldn't be surprising if we saw Pogaccio in the yellow jersey from day one. Vingegaard's going in underdone, but I think by week three he'll be a massive challenge. But we've got the likes of Pidcock, Tom Pidcock, who's the reigning mountain bike world champion, and has just shown enormous potential on the road. Spinot hits the front, but here comes Peacock through the centre. Tom Peacock's there, and finally, the unfinished business is complete. Achievement unlocked for Tom Pidcock, who wins the Amstel Gold at the third time of asking. He'll be there with Ineos, Primoz Roglic, who uh, has won five Grand Tours in his career, but the Tour de France has always been a little bit bad luck for him, unfortunately. Another Another crash. And it's Roglic. Roglic. Second place overall last year. Primoz Roglic has gone down heavily. But he's back to break that hex and he's incredible. There's a young rider who's the world champion at the moment, Remco Venepoel from Belgium, and everybody's just been waiting for him to have that moment where he steps up and is unbeatable across a Grand Tour. He has already done that in one-day races. And I think then if you also look at the Aussies, we've got Jack Haig and Jai Hindley there. Hindley's a Grand Tour winner in his own right. From down under to the very, very top in Italy, on the streets of Verona, right outside the famous Roman amphitheatre. Vedi, Vidi, Hindley! He wins the Giro d'Italia. It has happened. Jack Haig's been on the podium in Grand Tours before. There's a lot of individual riders who could really upset the apple cart. And when you think about the way the race develops, if they're in a group of 10 riders and Jonas Vingegaard is there, Jai Hindley is there, Pidcock is there, Pogaccia can't chase all of them. So if they almost work, if the other teams almost work together against Pogaccia, I think that there could be a really big threat there. But sometimes, you know, you're sitting at the TV kind of yelling and wishing that they would listen to you and hear you, but it doesn't eventuate quite like that. You mentioned Hindley. Obviously, he's not the lead rider for his team, Bora Hansgrove. It's Primoz Roglic, another rider you mentioned. Is there a sense that the Perth product almost has a point to prove here? Yeah, it's really interesting because I think that some riders do best and thrive the most in a team environment where there are co-leaders. And Roglic goes in as favourite, but as I mentioned, Roglic has very often had disastrous Tour de France and to a degree we often call him on the podcast the sticky tape man because inevitably when you see him he's got bandages all over him. He looks like he's held together um, by flexi tape and I think when you are the right-hand man of, of someone who doesn't have the best record in getting through tours and perhaps you know that there's a very realistic chance of being the plan B. And I actually think it takes a lot of pressure off Jai Hindley going in because all eyes are on him to support and not to be. But given the right opportunity and depending on how the race plays out, it wouldn't surprise me if he ended up being their lead man. And I think he has it in the back of his mind as well. 
We heard you talk about Jack Haig as well. He's such an exciting rider. Is there a particular stage you think that he might be targeting as a potential, you know, stage winner? Yeah, Jack Haig is really cool. Like the way that he approaches a race is almost unlike most other riders. I mean, down to the fact that he weighs his handlebars before the bike gets built. He weighs every component to make sure that it's the lightest version of that. And I think that there will be a lot of opportunities in the mountains for him. The first one, honestly, on stage one, he might go quite well. But the first uh, real opportunity, I think, is on stage four, which is already heading straight into the mountains. And then when you get into the second week, stage 11, is another really good opportunity for him. And that's where they start going up to a little bit higher altitude, up towards 2,000 metres. And that's where he'll really enjoy making the sprinters suffer uh, in particular. But this tour, the back end of the tour, like week three, uh, is where it really is quite brutal. And that's where Jack Haig will really flourish. Just finally, because of the Paris Olympic Games, they won't actually finish the race in the nation's capital, which feels odd. Uh, Where are they wrapping up and how do you feel about it? It's very strange. And you know what's even stranger, Pat? They're finishing in Nice. So they're they're in Monaco uh, going to Nice. And it's an individual time trial for the final stage, which we have not seen in the Tour de France in any modern time. It's really curious. I mean, they've got to do something different, right, because they can't finish on the Champs-Élysées. I think there'll be a beach volleyball stadium there or something. But what they need to do to do an individual time trial at the end, it means that normally we sort of know the winner on the day before and it's a procession, but this year there will be no procession. Individual time trials are pretty cruel events actually. Mm. So uh, it'll be spectacular, but the event organisers were thinking about the spectacle rather than the riders when they put this one in. It's gonna, They're going to have to really earn it. Catherine Bates, thanks so yes. much for your time. appreciate it. Cheers, Pat. Headlines. Sports Integrity Australia has found no evidence players in the AFL were feigning injuries to avoid illicit drug use strikes. The investigation followed claims from independent MP Andrew Wilkie that players had been given, quote, off the book, end quote, drug tests. Wilkie is standing by his claims. The AFL has welcomed the findings from SIA. For the full story, go to abc.net.au slash sport. In case you missed the T20 World Cup over the weekend, Afghanistan scored maybe the biggest win in their history as they knocked over Australia. The Aussies' campaign is hanging by a thread and they play India Monday night slash Tuesday morning, even if they win there. They could still miss out on the competition semi-finals, which would be huge. You can catch every ball live and free on the ABC Listen app. We are counting down to the Melbourne edition of State of Origin and it was interesting to see legendary blue Andrew Johns suggest Latrell Mitchell is in the heads of the Maroons. Cannot wait to catch game two on the ABC Listener. And tennis, Ola Tomlanovic has fallen just short at Queen's, losing the final of the Wimbledon warm-up to Yulia Puntenseva, 6-1, 7-6. It's been a long road back for the Australian as she's battled a series of injury issues. Her ranking climbed back to 135, and she has been given a wild card for the year's grass court major. For more tennis, you should get around ABC Tennis Pod with Catherine Murphy. I'm Patrick Stack. This is ABC Sport Daily, and it's produced by Poppy Penny. Thanks to SBS, Flowbikes, and Theo Giro d'Italia for the extra audio used in this episode. Discover more great ABC podcasts, live radio, and exclusives on the ABC Listen app.